Well, hello again. It's Bruce Williams, and today it's time for my fifth lecture in my series on ultrastructural pathology and description. And it's going to be the last of three on trying to figure out normal tissue. Today we're going to start with the cardiovascular system. And I know that when many of you took histology, it was sort of a blur when we talked about muscle, okay, where you have actin filaments and myosin filaments and the Z disc and the I band and the A band. And we're going to forget about most of that when we deal with muscle tissue in ultrastructure. Okay, but the things that I do want you to remember and to understand are fairly simple. It is the actin filaments and the myosin filaments, which when the cytosol is flooded with calcium, will crawl along each other and cause contraction of the muscle fiber. When these filaments crawl across each other, it's going to bring these Z discs, Z bands, whatever you want to call them, or in the heart, intercalated discs, closer together and the entire sarcomere shrinks. That's how muscle contracts. And that's all you have to remember. You don't have to remember A1 zones or AH zones or anything like that. Let's try and keep this very simple. And I'm going to show you the difference between cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. It's really basically the same stuff. There are some slight different variations, very slight, but enough that you can tell when you're looking at heart muscle and when you're looking at regular skeletal muscle. We talked about the liberation of calcium, how important it is. And here's a close-up showing some really cool things about muscle tissue. Number one, here are our sarcomeres. They're delineated by Z bands, which in the heart we're going to call the intercalated discs. Here are the actin filaments, the myosin filaments. When they crawl across each other, they become very dense. Okay, but you have to have calcium. Muscle fibers require calcium to contract, and they're going to stay contracted until calcium comes back out. That's why when cell muscle cells degenerate and die, they often contract because nothing's pulling that calcium back out. And the requirement to pull calcium or to liberate calcium into the cytosol and pull it back out is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's sort of like smoothing the plasma reticulum, but you know, it's these calcium pumps in there. And that is at the edges of the sarcomere. It's a pretty intricate network, but you can see it on ultrastructure. And then the last thing I want to point out on this uh, particular electron micrograph goes back to form follows function and how you can tell a lot about a cell by why the, how the mitochondria are formed and where they're placed. Okay, look at these mitochondria, big boxcar-like mitochondria, tremendous Christie, and where are they sitting? They're sitting right on top of the contractile fibers. That is where all the action is needed, all the ATP is required, and they are going to be in the thick of things here. So this is what you would expect to see with muscle fibers of any, any type. And I think they're a lot more prominent in skeletal muscle than they are in heart muscle. Now, I promised I would tell you how to tell the difference between skeletal muscle and heart muscle. They have the same component, so how can you tell where you are? Well, first I want you to look at the inset. Normally we look at the big picture first, but I want you to look at the inset. Okay, see how everything is in register. This is how skeletal muscle is set up. The contraction in skeletal muscle is the same all the time. All it does is contract. Contract your muscle, relax your muscle. Contract your muscle and relax your muscle. The contraction is a little different in heart muscle. It has to respond to electrical impulses arising in, in various areas. So it has, it is set up, it, muscle fibers can only contract, but it's set up a little more loosely. Okay, skeletal muscle, all of your sarcomeres are in line. All of your Z bands are in line. Even all of your mitochondria are in line. It's, it's repetitive, it's stereotypical, it's a little on the boring side. When you get into cardiac muscle, 
Everything's a little different. Look, it's not really in register. They're offset. They're off kilter. Your Z bands or what we call intercalated discs sort of they sort of flow around like a, a lazy river. The mitochondria, some are on end. They don't line up very nicely. Okay, so when everything is a little bit out of kilter, you're probably looking at the heart. And when everything is just regimented, you're looking at traditional skeletal muscle. Now, I like skeletal muscle in terms of vocabulary, in terms of the way it degenerates. It, you know, it does all of the regular things that we've seen. We've seen everything from uh, swelling of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and, and the nuclear membrane. Uh, we've seen the formation of autophagosomes things like that. There is a one other word, and really only one other word that I want you to remember when we talk about the degenerative process of either cardiac or skeletal muscle. And it happens because remember one of the early things that happens when you lose the ability to make ATP, when you lose oxygen, when you're deprived of oxygen. We talked about this before. One well, of the early things is that the, the cytoskeleton breaks down. Actin switches from filamentous to globular form. Microtubules disassociate. The whole skeleton breaks down. Okay. Well, when a lot of your cell is composed of actin and myosin, what's going to happen? It's going to fall apart. And this is what happens. This is a uh, the skeletal muscle of a calf with vitamin E selenium deficiency. It really doesn't make that much difference. But, but what you see is you start to see this streaming. The first thing that you'll see is this sort of streaming of these myofilaments as they start to break down. You see that the Z bands now are just all over the place. Okay, the term for this is myofibrillo lysis okay it's just those those uh, uh actin and myosin filaments falling to pieces so this is myofibrillo lysis you can see that the the mitochondria are undergoing low amplitude swelling here where the cristae get big and abnormally shaped and they compress the granular matrix making that dark can this cell regenerate I think it probably can if uh, you know oxygen is restored or whatever the you know at this point we're probably since it's vitamin E selenium we have significant abnormalities in the cellular and organelle membranes that are contributing to the problem but they could probably regenerate at this point but as the process gets worse then you see more and more loss of the myofibers. This was from the heart of a duckling that was poisoned with furazolidone, which um, is well known for its effect on heart muscle and the resultant myofibrillolysis. Remember that picture of the rat that was given the cationic compound that was laying waste to its uh, uh, to its adrenal gland in the last lecture? Well, here's what would happen if you gave the same compound um, to an animal here and you have degeneration of the organelles. The organelles are not functioning. The sarcomeres are beginning to break down. So the word that I want you to remember to go all the way back here is myofibrillolysis. And then we've used all these terms before, lamellar bodies, autophagic vacuoles, uh, low and high amplitude swelling. So we're not learning much more new vocabulary, but that myofibrillolysis word is a great one to use when you're presented with degenerating muscle fibers. Okay, this is the end stage of degeneration with furazolidone. We're going back to our duckling, and you can just see a couple of the, you know, the the myofibers, the, the actin and myosin filaments, the myofilaments hanging on here. The mitochondria may be not too bad at this point, but but everything is gone. Will this regenerate? And that's always the question. As long as that basement membrane is intact um, and the noxious stimulus or hypoxia is removed, it probably at this point will regenerate. 
as we know from histology, once that cell membrane breaks down and you have influx of a variety of compounds that shouldn't be in the cell, as well as uh, calcium, as well as macrophages and things like that, no, it won't. Now, so that is the basic setup and breakdown of skeletal muscle and heart muscle. I do not want to leave anybody out. So I want to mention just for a minute what smooth muscle looks like. And smooth muscle, um, when it contracts, it doesn't shorten very much. Or let's say it shortens in all directions. It sort of, when smooth muscle contracts, it sort of shrinks down. Um, smooth muscle does not have the actin and myofilaments put together like the other two forms of muscles do. They actually have thick and thin filaments scattered throughout the cytoplasm, and they have what are known as adhesion densities where these filaments anchor into. And they're going sort of willy-nilly, and when this muscle contracts then, it's just going to sort of shrink up. Okay? So, um, they usually have ovoid to sometimes ribbon-shaped uh, or cigar-shaped nuclei. And the distribution of the thin and thick filaments is everywhere but right in the perinuclear area where you can usually find a concentration of the organelles. So that's smooth muscle. Just a couple of other things as we look at the other parts of the cardiovascular system when we talk about the, uh, the blood vessels. Um, if you look at endothelial cells very closely, you will see these structures that look a little bit like multivesicular bodies. They have an intricate scroll work. These are the Weibull Pilati bodies, which are the concentrating sites for factor VIII related antigen in endothelial cells. We've looked at a number of endothelials before. They're sort of boring. They don't have a lot of, of, uh, <clears throat> of organelles. They're usually a very thin lining on the inside of a vessel. And if you see a nucleus, oh, that's a good day. Put a little bit of degeneration. This is an older picture of a rabbit with a aortic lipid deposit. And the white space here is going to represent the, the lumen of this artery. And then this is the blood vessel wall. One thing I, that I want you to see here is that it is covered by an intact endothelial cell with a nucleus, long processes. And then underneath this, you have uh, all of these clear holes. And we've talked about how when lipid is processed in paraffin embedded tissue, it is degraded and removed by a series of increasing concentrations of alcohol. And that's what's happened here. This particular specimen was dug out of a, a paraffin block. The lipid has largely been removed. We have a little bit of rim here. And this is a foam cell. It's a macrophage that has, uh, has taken in a lot of this lipid. And this is what you see in uh, plaques in Watanabe rabbits who have abnormal LDL receptors on their hepatocytes and have up to 11 times the normal uh, secreting amount of fat. It's a classic animal model, largely has been replaced by numerous uh, genetically engineered mice, but it's a classic one. And then we have uh, degeneration in the adjacent wall and basement membrane of this blood vessel. This is atherosclerosis. Now, people want to know what's the difference between atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis, and there are many types of arteriosclerosis. Uh, but the, the classic uh, difference between atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis is the components of the wall will be fat in one, mineral in another. And so 
Here's what mineral looks like. If you have calcium deposits or a lot of mineral on the wall of any tissue, it's going to be black, black, black. Okay, that's why uh, uh, you can't look at uh, undemineralized bone uh, under the EM because there's nothing to see. It's just uh, the great black wasteland. So just a little bit about some uh, uh, some vascular changes. Now, sometimes at the end of these little system reviews, I give you a uh, electron micrograph and I give you a little time and you get to scratch your head and it's complicated but we go through it and, and I didn't want to leave here without one of those so I'm going to give you this particular uh, electron micrograph and it's got bits that we have everything in here we've talked about before so I want you maybe to, to shut down the, the video for a minute and take a good look and then we're going to go over. I am going to tell you that this is from a laboratory macaque who had been injected by with an agent. Okay, so let's see what we can figure out. Okay, what are we looking at here? Well, I got a couple things that are going to jump out at me. And we're going to talk about some of these in in more detail. But the first thing I always look for in an EM are erythrocytes. And they're my friends. And they're usually a little bit darker. Um, usually they take up the osmium a little better, but we do have them here. So we have erythrocytes. Got some here. I got some over here. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, but I know that I'm in a capillary. Okay, I'm in a vessel of some type. So what else can we see? Well, I see this malt cell with a lot of granules and, and a multi-lobated nucleus. And we've talked about this before. When you see multiple lobes, an EM, I want you to think primarily of neutrophils. Could it be an eosinophil? It could, but for right now we're a neutrophil that should be in a capillary and then then we have these little things here with the with granules and i don't see any nuclei in them and those are platelets so i think we're in a big vessel here and we've got several platelets at the same site so that's never a good thing when platelets aggregate and i see them starting to aggregate right here and this is the wall of the vessel and they're forming a platelet plug. Here is an endothelial cell. You can see the, the vascular basement membrane right here. So this is, this whole thing's our capillary. We have a rupture. We have a endothelial cell which is contracted. It's dark, probably degenerating. Okay, and then on this half of the slide, these round, really densely staining structures are Bacteria. We've looked at a couple of them before. So bacteria, we're going to talk about that in the next lecture, are boring. They're boring, 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 and you don't really get a lot of substructure within them. You just get a lot of staining of the cell wall. And so it's really difficult to tell one bacteria from another, but I can certainly tell that there's bacteria. They're surrounded by either some artifact or there may be a capsule. Okay, here's some erythrocytes over here. And there's no vessel here, so they've gotten out. So we have an area of hemorrhage with bacteria, and then we have all of this black matted stuff here very closely together. What happens when you rupture a vessel? That's fibrin. So these are mats of fibrin, hemorrhage. I see this, this particular cell here. I'm not exactly sure. Could that, not a lot of granules. Could that be a macrophage? It very well might be. I'm looking for pseudopods. I don't see them, but I'm not sure the identity of cell. But I would imagine in the area of a ruptured vessel with hemorrhage and fibrin, you'd have some inflammatory cells. So could it, it could be a neutrophil, just not a lot of granules like you would expect. So I'm going to flip all the cards on this one. This is a meningeal vessel from a monkey who had been injected with anthrax. 
Remember that animals with anthrax, anthrax releases a number of factors, including lethal factor and edema factor, which cause severe vascular damage and necrosis. And this was an experimental infection with anthrax. It's a complicated picture because of the bacteria. You're not going to get to a particular uh, diagnosis of anthrax, obviously. But if you got to the fact that you have damage to a vessel, liberation of fibrin and bacteria, then you've pretty much gotten everything you can out of this image. Nobody's going to walk up to you and just give you this image and say, hey, what is it? But they might say, hey, we have this experimental protocol with anthrax and kex, and you, can you explain this to me? And I hope that you would get those, uh, those particular features. Okay, musculoskeletal system. We've covered muscle pretty well, so I don't have too much more to say. Okay, Z-bands or Z-discs, sarcomere, actin and myosin filaments, and then when this muscle contracts, you're going to get this squeezed in. It probably is going to end up here and here during active contraction of this muscle, but everything is in register, so you shouldn't have any trouble um, recognizing skeletal muscle. Damaged skeletal muscle, sure. Um, this is an odd case. It was acid maltase deficiency, which is a type 2 glycogenosis, also known as Pompe's disease. You can't get there from here, but you can certainly say that there, this cell is irreversibly damaged with uh, damage to cell membranes, both extra and intracellular. Look at the formation of these lamellar or zebra bodies. Uh, the large numbers of autophagosomes. This really black staining is probably a lot of free lipid and the this entire cell. And I'm always amazed when the adjacent cells look actually pretty good. Yeah, we have some problems here, but they don't look as bad, but this is just a mess. So we covered muscle. Um, I didn't want to mention uh, bone for just a second, and, and there's not a lot to say about bone. Form follows function. I said that if you didn't demineralize your bone, there's not much to look at. So this is a poor job of demineralization. Everything would be black, but it does highlight what's going on in this lacuna as well. And this is an osteocyte, uh, and you can tell what it, what a, or it could be an osteoblast. I, I don't think you can really tell the difference. If it's sitting in a lacuna, it's probably an osteocyte, but it still has the remnants of large amounts of rough endoplasmic reticulum because what does it make? It's going to make osteoids. So it's going to excrete a lot of the protein from the cell. Um, the bony cannulicula, it's funny, you, we look at them in, in uh, two dimensions and we think, oh, they're all, you know, these are, these are disconnected cells. Uh, lacuna is Latin for a an apartment or what they probably call nowadays a cubicle. But you know, bones generally have have uh, the cannulicite to do connect to each other. They usually have a long process which will connect one cell to another so they can work in concert. So, uh, but so this is sort of what you would expect. I guess with an osteocyte. Very similar picture when we deal with chondrocytes, but you do have this sort of lucent granular proteoglycan matrix surrounding it, lots of uh, of refendoplasmic reticulum because all it does is is uh, look for matrix. When you look at these cells that have lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum, remember that all those proteins have to be uh, uh, submitted through the Golgi apparatus. They have to be addressed. This one, you can see a Golgi apparatus here, but in, in these cells, you often will find a pretty prominent uh, Golgi apparatus. Uh, oh, I should have showed you this before. Uh, once again, here are a couple of cells. They're next to each other. They're not in lacunae. They rough endoplasmic reticulum along the surface of mineralized bone. So these are probably osteoblasts. Can you tell the difference between an osteocyte and an osteoblast? Mm, I don't know. You know, it'd be nice to say, well, this has more or less euchromatin, and this is very active. But 
I don't think I can tell. That's why so much of what we do in ultrastructure has to be done in context of the sample. We've said it before, I'll say it again before we're done. Uh, nobody doing ultrastructure wants or needs to be blinded to what's going on. It's tough enough when you're looking at one or two cells without you know, not knowing the process or the species or what, what has been, how it's been manipulated. Um, and this one is, is just totally out of, uh, this one is out, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, this is, this actually should be, I'm looking at that saying, how is this musculoskeletal? This one actually uh, should be in the reproductive system. It just got uh, pushed into the wrong spot. I apologize for that. Maybe just a quick review. We said that there are a number of places in the body that have cilia. And this has especially long and lush cilia, and this is a cross section through the uh, uh, through the epididymis of a rat. And you can see here are the spermatozoa or the spermatids. Here's one cro cut and cross section. If we got a little closer, we could see the nine plus two arrangement of the cilium. I mean, it's, yeah, the, of the uh, the cilium of the or the tail of the sperm. So just another spot. You know, we don't think of the reproductive tract as a place where you have a lot of cilia, but it is, both male and female. And as such, um, we will see in our next lecture, we talk about bacteria, especially those who want nothing more out of life than to be a cilium, how and why they could be affected by certain agents. Okay, minor misstep, put some repro in the, in the musculoskeletal. Um, but let's move on to, we got only have one more system and then some miscellaneous. So, a uh, hematolymphatic, we've seen a number of these before, and this is a really beautiful shot of a neutrophil. They have multi-lobated uh, nuclei. Um, multi-lobate, I don't like polymorphonuclear as much, very well as a term, because it's really one nuclei with multiple uh, different lobes on it. The uh, They do have, have small pseudopods, but they never get very big, and they have almost no identifiable organelles except for um, these various granules which have everything from uh, myeloperoxidase to serine proteases to elastase to cathepsins uh, to a little bit of everything because basically they are just ocean-going hand grenades. And the average lifespan of a neutrophil should be less than about eight hours. They're supposed to go find areas of inflammation and then explode themselves and make everything better or worse, as the case may be. So we don't see organelles, which would imply a longer lifespan. Um, these are the ones that you will normally see in vessels. So we've seen them. They're not quite as helpful as erythrocytes, but they're very helpful to identify that you're in the area of a vessel. Um, here is one that is emigrating at a site of inflammation. It must be a painful process because this guy's sort of screaming, ah! Um, but what happens is the endothelial cells will contract. So here's two endothelial cells. Here's the basement membrane of the vessel and our friends the erythrocytes. And I'm not sure what cell type this is right here. It's a process of a cell with some granules. That could be another neutrophil. Maybe it is a platelet because I don't see a nucleus. But, but so here is the emigration um, and probably the inflammatory stimulus is somewhere in the neighborhood. And we have the whole process of, of rolling adhesion and eventually emigration from the blood vessel. Neutrophils and eosinophils, we talked about before. Hey, they could look alike on the right section. They have a multi-lobated nucleus. This one is nice because you can see the multiple lobes. But one thing that eosinophils have is that neutrophils do not is they see they have these uh, granules with a dense, often linear a crystalloid, which is thought to be major basic protein. Uh, there's often a lot of histamine that might be what's surrounding them, but this is your major basic protein, a very caustic substance. That's why eosinophilic inflammation tends to cause a lot more damage than, the than damage caused by the corresponding amount of neutrophils. Um, 
So but they're often attacking parasites or something like that, which are a little tougher than your average bacterium. I would imagine never having be, been an eosinophil. Basophil. This is probably a once-in-a-lifetime picture um, because when you talk with clinical pathologists, they're like, boy, it's a great day when I see a basophil. You don't come across basophils um, very often. And to come across one in a blood sample on ultrastructure is pretty amazing. Um, they are like ocean-going mast cells. I'm going to show you mast cells in a couple of minutes. And the one thing about mast cells is they have these histamine-containing uh, granules, which are always very intricate. They are beautiful. They have little scroll work in them. And so some of the ones that basophils have are like that, too. They also have uh, heparin-containing granules and a couple of other compounds. You may never see another basophil. Once again, multiple lobules in the nucleus. If you were to tell me if you see this and you said there's a neutrophil, I probably wouldn't disagree with you. The thing about mast cells and basophils is a lot of times when they degranulate, there's a hole in the cytoplasm. And if you've seen this, you've probably seen this on, uh, uh, on histologic slides. You can see some very mothy mast cells following degranulation. It seems to take a while um, for them to regenerate the granules. So it pops out and you have like this clear space, which you can see uh, under the microscope even. So macrophages. You're going to tell a macrophage because it doesn't have a lot of organelles because it's not especially long lived. It has granules. Okay, but the most important thing about macrophages, and we've mentioned this before when we talked about Kupfer cells in the liver, is the fact that they have pseudopods. We even talked about it when we were talking about glomerulonephritis. And they have pseudopods. They have long pseudopods um, that no other cell type has. We saw the stubby ones that neutrophils have. They're not going to do much because these are phagocytic cells. They will surround, they will engulf, and they can really do some amazing things with their cytoskeleton. Um, and then, then some smart people out there are going to say, uh, well, this one has uh, a sort of bean-shaped nucleus, and that's very characteristic of uh, macrophages and histiocytes, and, and it probably is. But you're not going to see this very often. You have to cut it just right to get it. What if you cut it this way? It would just look round. So I don't count on looking for bean-shaped nuclei very much in macrophages, at least not on ultrastructure. So uh, that's what a macrophage, and when you're looking at macrophages, I can't say enough. Pseudopods, pseudopods, pseudopods. And if you see that, you're in pretty good shape for, for saying I think that that's histiocytic. Here's the brains of the operation. Here's the lymphocyte. You know, it doesn't look all that smart. It has very few organelles. It does have a big nucleus. Um, but a lot of that nucleus is heterochromatin. It has a nucleolus. But look at the organelles, just about Zippo. We've got two mitochondria in this plane of section. Okay, and that's it. So for something that sort of runs the entire immune response, it is a very non-engaging appearance to these important cells. I think that the plasma cells are the coolest looking of all the hematopoietic cells. Okay, and this is what you expect. This is an absolute classic. Okay, we have all of this rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and because that's what these cells do, they make antibodies. Remember when you first learned about plasma cells and they said, oh, it's got a clock face centrally placed nucleus. Well, that's exactly what they were referring to. A fair amount of heterochromatin, usually centrally located. And as we've said before, if you have all this rough endoplasmic reticulum, what is this cell going to look like under the microscope? It's going to be a deep purple, and which is what we expect from plasma cells. The one thing that I don't see in this particular section, although I can see a couple of mit big mitochondria here, I don't see the Golgi. And these generally have a very large Golgi, maybe the largest Golgi of almost any cell type. And it generally, it doesn't stain very well. 
opposed to the rest of the cell, it stains dark purple. So that's what we would call the Hof. So when you're looking at the so-called Hof of a plasma cell, it is, uh, uh, it's usually the Golgi apparatus, and it's big enough that we can see it. Not sure what's going on here. This could be a mast cell. Um, it's got some granules and got these holes in the cytoplasm, but I certainly wouldn't want to stick my neck out on that one. Here's another plasma cell. But the difference here is that you have this aggregate and you can, if you look really closely, it's dark and it's linear and I can see straight lines in here. And this is crystalline protein. This is antibody that has not been released as opposed to the last plasma cell. This is what a Russell body cell or a Mott cell would look like. Some people call them constipated plasma cells. Uh, that seems like an uncomfortable choice of a term to me, but it sort of implies that um, whether it's a, a temporal thing and this one is about to release all the antibodies or it just for some reason cannot, uh, here is what a, a Russell body looks like. A lot of, of crystalline protein and you know, we, we talk about when you see crystalline protein, it usually translates to bright pink on your H and E slides. So think about your average Russell body cells. It's a little bit of purple in these large pink globules. So we're still thinking in terms of trying to correlate the black and white into pink and purple. We've seen these before. This is a megakaryocyte with a large, it's going to have a multi-lobated nucleus, but you almost never see an EM of an entire megakaryocyte because they're quite large. But you can see the, uh, the platelets, which are cleaving off from this particular, there might even be, you might even see some cleavage lines in here where, where they're starting to break off. Okay, these, these platelets have uh, dense granules with a variety of substances. Um, and they have no nucleus, and they will take off, and they will they will find places to uh, to aggregate and, and to plug breaks in the uh, various vessels. And it's a nice picture. You will see these very commonly, very commonly, in uh, EM of vessels. Okay, and just another picture of platelets. This is one that's sort of flattened out in cutting, and you have a variety of uh, of granules containing all sorts of things, from from serotonin to platelet factor four to thromboglobulin, and all that. And a lot of normal organelles, uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, maybe a little bit of rough endoplasmic reticulum, the occasional mitochondria. Um, but these these cells have no nucleus. They're not going to make any more protein that they, than they have already made. They have a very limited lifespan, although they break the rule about not having any organelles if you're short-lived. They're just a fragment of a bigger cell that retained its nucleus, and these are going to be gone in a couple of hours. Okay, we are getting close to the end of the Where Am I lectures, and I'm just going to show you some fun things. And uh, these are a couple pictures. I think these came out of Weeders, um, which is a great textbook. It's uh, uh, human, but has great EM scattered through there. And this is actually a cross-section through a squamous epithelium. And you can see at the bottom you have a basement membrane, then you have the basal layer, um, which gives rise to the stratum spongiosum. Um, and this is where you still have nuclei, and then nuclei start to disappear. The cells will flatten out, and it gets all the way up to the stratum corneum and the overlying keratin layer. I don't think anyone would ever um, would ever put that on an exam or something, but that's a nice picture. And then this is a picture actually from a squamous cell carcinoma. The cells have huge uh, nuclei, but what I wanted to show are all these desmosomes, and what we're looking at here are the keratin filaments that go into the uh, those desmosomes and there's a lot in the cytoplasm of these cells as well um, some squamous cell carcinomas keratinize some don't 
Oh, you have a lot of non-keratinizing squamous carcinomas, especially in the head of horses, up in the sinuses, because they come from a non-keratinizing type of epithelium from the alveolus. But uh, this is sort of cool. And if anyone's ever described to you uh, intracellular bridging as part of the, the diagnosis of of squamous cell carcinoma. This is a great example because this is probably edema fluid in here and it's, it's trying to push these cells apart, but what you have are the desmosomes are still hanging in there. So intercellular bridging, squamous cell carcinoma, just a little fun with squamous epithelium. Okay, um, we're still in the skin. And I want you to look at this here. It looks like a little football, and there's cross hatchings, and there's a bit of darkness to it. And this is a developing melanosome. Okay, and they start out without this dark and just the cross hatching. They look like little footballs. And and here is uh, a melanocyte, and you can see these are the ones. You you can see some structures in here. Right here, this one looks like a little watermelon, and it's a little tough to, you can get them confused with mitochondria, because they're about the same size. But in mitochondria, the cristae tend to go horizontally from surface, in melanosomes, these, these lines will go sort of along the top. Okay, that's a terrible description. Um, this is a melanocyte. Remember that most of the pigment in your skin is not in your melanocytes. Melanocytes pass them to squamous epithelium. Okay, they have the ability to pass it into squamous epithelial cells, which if you look at somebody who has a really good tan, okay, what is the purpose of melanin? It's to prevent ultraviolet light from causing damage to the DNA in the nucleus. Okay, and so if you look at somebody with a really good tan, um, you will see that the melanocytes will orient themselves between the surface of the skin and the nucleus, like a little hat. It's really cool. But just remember that melanosomes, as they they uh, as these mature, will pass them into other cells, into squamous epithelial cells, and I think that's what's going on here. Um, so those are, and that's what you will look like for melanomas. Amelanotic melanomas will still have melanosomes, but they won't have any pigment in them. So, so much for that. What else we have? These are, I like these. These are fun. Okay. T, see this T here? Well, it looks like a tennis racket. Okay. But you see these sort of linear granules here. You see these in dendritic cells. These are Burbex granules, and I don't know anything else about them. I think it's sort of cool. They look like little tennis racket handles, and occasionally they will have swellings at the end and actually look like little tennis rackets. And those are, These are Burbex granules, and I'm sure that I should know more about these, but I've gotten 30 years into this profession without knowing anything more, so it doesn't seem to have adversely affected me. Okay, I've, I've often said that uh, you can tell a lot about a cell by the company it keeps. Or I've said something like that. And here's one that we know that we have a spindle cell. We know that there's tremendous amount of rough endoplasmic reticulum, so it's packaging protein for export. But the diagnosis here is based on what is in the extracellular space. And what you see are large numbers, tough to tell on cross-section, but when you come down here you see large amounts of collagen. Okay, so we said before fibroblasts, you can't see the the components while they're being made, but once they assemble in the extracellular space, you can make them out for collagen, and a spindle cell with a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum that is surrounded by collagen, I'm going to call a fibroblast until proven otherwise. But notice, it looks a little bit like a chondrocyte, and it looks like those osteoblasts as well. Okay, it is the companies you keep. We knew the other one was a chondroblast because it's surrounded by a proteoglycan-rich 
sort of granular, lucent matrix. We knew that the other ones were osteoblasts or osteocytes because of what surrounded them. So don't expend all your energy trying to figure out what a cell is without taking in the context of the ultrastructure. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. Context is extremely important in ultrastructural pathology. Earlier I showed you, oh, here's a good, this one has a, a couple of good points. Okay, what kind of cell is that? Well, heck, I can't really tell. I can tell you it's probably mesenchymal, it's long, it's spindled, but it's full of these vacuoles. Okay, so it's not good, whatever it is, but once again, if we look all around, it is surrounded by collagen. So I will bet you a dollar to a donut that this is going to be a fibroblast. Okay, it's the comp sometimes it's just the company that you keep. So why do we have all of these vacuoles? Okay, I showed you a picture in the last lecture about a cat with feline mucolipidosis, which had tremendous damage to the oligodendrocytes and consequentially to the myelin and the myelinated nerves. And this is another picture from the same cat. And this is one of the great frustrations of dealing with lysosomal storage disorders uh, on any type of EM or even on glass. They all look alike. They tend to have, um, they have tremendous number of, of ineffective phagolysosomes, which can be filled with anything from stuff that doesn't show up very well on EM or a little bit of, of debris or the beautiful lamellar bodies. And it, they do not have these cells by virtue of their genetic deficiency, do not have the proper enzymes to break them down. It usually starts in, in mesenchymal cells, especially, or, or macrophages, fibroblasts or whatever, and often spreads to other cells that take a little while longer to be affected. Macrophages are often the first because they are phagocytic if a cell um, has this to the point that it dies, it may be cleaned up by a macrophage. And they will pick up this material, but once again, do not have that particular enzyme to break it down. So they will eventually get stuffed up with it. So lysosomal storage diseases, if you give me one under the microscope, I can look at it and I can tell you it's a lysosomal storage disease and that's as far as I'm gonna go. Same thing with EM. You gotta do better than that. You have to know a little bit about the, uh, the animal and the presentation uh, because sometimes the old days you used to split them up by species and by age affected and by organs affected. Nowadays we have much more sophisticated ways to actually look at the genetic mutations in these animals and that is where you get your your final diagnosis in these particular cases. Okay, it's a big black blob. Okay, so we've looked at a couple of things that will cause big black blobs. And the one that probably will come to our mind first is fat. And this is what a normal adipocyte looks like. Just a regular run-of-the-mill adipocyte with a big globule of fat displacing and peripheralizing the nucleus. So there's your adipocyte. Now, there are two types of fat. There's white fat and brown fat. One of my favorite, favorite ultrastructural pictures of all time is this one. And I love this picture. Okay, because this, well, here are our friends, the erythrocytes. So we got some capillaries, but I'm not worried too much about that. What I want you to see is this big, this is one cell right here, nucleus, and then the cytoplasm is absolutely taken up by big droplets of fat and all these mitochondria, okay? And this is what brown fat looks like. And we don't see a lot of brown fat. You see it in very young animals who have trouble maintaining a body temperature. And the purpose of brown fat is to raise the body temperature. And you, you say, well, how does fat do that? Okay, how can you really raise your body temperature? Well, what brown, brown fat does, it, it has the ability to uncouple electron transport from ATP production and all of these mitochondria. And so one of the byproducts of that is heat. 
And so it purposely goes into anaerobic glycolysis and it uses these big fat droplets as the substrate to run that process. And by doing so, it consumes itself, but it, it liberates heat. Okay, it's a great process. It is maybe the best example of form following function. All you need is heat. You gotta have mitochondria. You gotta have fat to burn. And that's what these cells are, and that's what they do. And it's just a great electron micrograph. Mast cells, I mentioned it before. Mast cells often have, and this one doesn't have, but I'll show you some in a minute, but this is a mast cell and it has all of these granules. And as I said before, what mast cells do when they liberate their granules, you often get these empty holes in the cytoplasm. And these will fill in over time, but this one has probably recently degranulated. And you can actually see this in mast cell tumors if you get way high up on, uh, especially traumatized ones, you get high up on high magnification. You'll see the holes in there, and I've always used that as sort of a, a clue that I might be looking at mast cells, especially when you get some of those uh, odd-looking tumors. And this is a picture from a, a human mast cell, but sometimes if you get close on mast cells, they're just, the, 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 they're, these granules are beautiful. It's like fine filigree uh, work and this beautiful scroll work. And so that's sort of a clue that uh, uh, you are looking at mast cells. And that brings us to the end of this particular lecture. And you've been fantastic. You've sat through five lectures already, I hope. We've talked about general cellular organelles. We've talked about, uh, we've talked about degeneration and, and how to identify normal. And you're like, when do we get to the pathology? Well, we've seen a lot of pathology so far. The next two lectures, we're going to, to look at what will be the end of your descriptions, which would be uh, the presence of agents that shouldn't be there, usually viruses, bacteria, uh, and other type of agents. So we've got two more lectures in this particular series. The fun lectures, although I think all of this is fun, maybe I'm a little uh, weird that way. So. Thanks for hanging in there. We'll see you for lecture six and seven. Till then, I wish you good luck, good life, good health, and goodbye.